Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? Hello, hello. Good morning. Good seeing you. Thanks for being here this weekend. I'm Daniel. I serve on staff here as senior pastor, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to Mountain Springs. I've been gone for a couple of weeks. The elders blessed my wife and I, encouraged us to go and have a romantic getaway. They didn't pay for it, but they blessed us in the going uh, to Hawaii. So we took Colorado weather to Hawaii. Did you hear the news recently about Hawaii? Yeah, it was raining and snow in Maui. So we're like, sorry, Hawaiian people, we're here. Anyway, it was so good to be there, enjoy my wife, spend time with her. We love being parents. You know where I'm going with this statement. We love being parents, but there is something so good about going together just away, the two of us, and talking and laughing and reading together, going on hikes together. We went on a pillbox hike, a World War II lookout place, went on a hike up there and uh, almost slipped off the ravine as I was holding, FaceTiming someone, my son like, dude, you should be here. Wait, you shouldn't be here, but this is so cool. Anyway, anyway my wife's like, turn FaceTime off. Anyway, it's so good to go up there and enjoy her, but it's so good to be back. Two weeks ago when I spoke, or three weeks ago, I forget when it was, when I spoke last, it was a vision weekend and Vision Weekend at Mountain Springs, and I shared about mission and vision and the next chapter of our church. And I want to say thank you for the feedback. It was overwhelming uh, in the 24 hours or so following that weekend of services, 50 or so emails, overwhelming uh, appreciation and affirmation of a sense of faith as to what God was doing here at Mountain Springs. So thank you for that. I want to share uh, an excerpt from one email that I received from a young lady by the name of Amanda. She wrote this, her and her husband, Chad. Uh, Dear Pastor Daniel, the Lord led us to Mountain Springs in August of last year as we were drawn by many things, including the leadership training for our 12-year-old son, the outreach into the community that was visible and vibrant, the weekend service teaching, and the focus on what the church is meant to be. However, this Vision Sunday just sealed the deal. We as a family have decided that we had decided that we needed to find a church that truly understood the purpose of the church is to be outward serving, not a club to join or be served by. I rejoiced all the way home from church on Sunday. We've seen so many churches swing from 100% foreign mission to 100% local mission, or even worse, become a self-serving organization, seeming to miss the fact that we're called to the nations. I'm sure you get a lot of emails each week, some filled with issues and problems. Yes. So we thought we'd send you a note of encouragement and it might be in order. I am so thankful uh, that this is maybe a token of one of the uh, many emails that I got. It's just so encouraging. I want to give you a vision update. Uh, We're going to try and do this regularly, maybe the first weekend of every month or so, a vision and mission update. Uh, We've done three things already in the first month of the year that are going towards our mission and our vision directly from the funding that was given on the Christmas Eve service. The Christmas Eve service, we gave together a gift to go towards community work, outreach, mission, local, global. Three things that we've done already. Number one is we've given 6,000 bucks to the Swaziland Care Point to provide fencing and a cooking structure around the property so that now we can feed 300 kids five times, five days a week. 300 kids, five days a week, so that's awesome. Uh, also, the Uganda Pastoral Training Institute, $5,000 to provide scholarships for 12 Ugandan pastors to each receive a five-month leadership training program for them to go plant and lead churches throughout Uganda. Also, the Care Portal, $4,000, allowing us to respond to even more children's needs here locally in El Paso County, working with the DHS, foster care agencies, and human trafficking ministries here in El Paso County. Since we started started in October of last year, our church has responded to 58 need requests here locally, touching the lives of 61 children directly with an economic impact of $24,000. Now, let me tell you, if we can give $4,000 into an initiative that has a $24,000 economic impact, that is kingdom, kingdom economics. It's just so good. So anyway, so thankful to all that God is doing in and through our lives and using us to make a difference. This is the gathering place where we are filled up, where we're inspired to spill out throughout the week. This isn't the apex of our spiritual lives. This should be a part of our spiritual lives where we're spilling out into our neighbourhoods and unto the nations. So if you have your Bibles, this weekend is the closing weekend of a series that we've been in since November, a four-month series going through First and Second Samuel in the Old Testament. We called it Kings and Kingdoms. This weekend, we're in chapter 24, the final chapter of Second Samuel. And it's going to be somewhat of a challenging, jarring end of the narrative. If you're like me and you like to watch a movie with a happy ending, or you like to read a novel with a 
predictable to some degree, but a happy ending. This book is not necessarily that. And though it doesn't end with this like everyone lived happily ever after ending, it does leave us with this point of suspense as to when is the real king going to come? When is the real king going to come? And it kind of leads us with this point of suspense as to this jarring thought of the anger of God, things being exposed, things being uh, maybe appealed to God based upon people, and all of this being played out. It leaves us with this thought of, we're still searching for a king. We're still searching. King David couldn't do it. King David was insufficient. We need something better. So that's where we're going to go this weekend. We'll start in verse one. I'm going to teach through it. Let me pray though as we dig into this text. <clears throat> Father, thank you, God, that we can gather on a weekend and maybe uh, we're guests here or maybe we're really part of the tribe that is Mountain Springs, regardless of how long we have been here. I'm so thankful, Jesus, that we're here right now. Lord, may every single person in this room right now, yes, them, May they feel a touch of you this weekend. May they feel your love. May they feel your acceptance. May they feel your absolute pursuit of them. From the guy that is pursuing a career to the, to the woman that's pursuing a career or to the stay-home parent or to the business leader, to whatever, the person that just moved to this state or the person preparing to move out of the state. God, I pray that now we would encounter you. That these next 30 minutes, we would truly say we met with God. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Verse one, the final weekend of the Kings and Kingdoms series, chapter 24, 2 Samuel. The anger of the Lord, somewhat jarring. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he incited David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. Okay, what I'm about to explain, verse one, is challenging for even those of us that have walked with God for many years. For those of you new to faith or new to church, this opening verse is going to do a number on you and you're going to go, what? I don't get it. Here's why. At a certain superficial level, verse 1 is basically David about to count some people. But at a deeper theological level, verse 1 represents one of the most robust theological constructs in all of Scripture. And that is this, God's sovereignty over our free will and responsibility. This verse frames God's overall sovereign plan and yet our responsibility, i.e. our free will, our choice to make the decisions that we wanna make. Effectively, here's what's going on. David, in that knowing God, knowing David's heart, knowing what was in David's heart to do, God permits David to do the census of Israel, while God, knowing that he would have to confront David in this sin, he permits him to do this thing, though it's a sin, though it's a problem. Okay, so some of you are like, whoa, whoa. so you're saying God can tempt us to sin. Absolutely not. God does not tempt us to sin, but God does permit us, because of choice and free will, to do things that create distance between us and Him, but He permits us to do sin, yet knowing that He will have to come and confront that. Here's why. God is sovereign, meaning, it's a big fancy term, meaning God can see from the beginning of time through the end of time. We cannot. We can barely see through Friday of next weekend. We struggle. We're like, God, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. Are my kids going to be okay? Is this going to work out? Are we going to be able to move okay? We can't see that. So we make decisions based upon what we don't see. Faith is the substance of those things we cannot see. Faith is the beginning of beyond your sight to where God is already present. God is already present. God is sovereign. So God being sovereign says, I want my nation to be a certain type of people. If David does this, and he does it to where now it's gonna be a sin, I'm gonna permit him to sin. Okay, track with me. I'm gonna permit David to sin so that I can correct this now because I would rather create pain in the short term than allow them to pursue a long-term direction that will create distance from me. Okay, now let me explain this personally. There are times in our lives where because of free will and choice, we do something that actually when exposed creates pain. Let me give you some real time examples. A friend of mine looking at pornography, clicked on the pornography right as his wife walked around the room, came around, saw him, he quickly scrolled the mouse. 
She said, what are you doing? He says, working on a spreadsheet. She goes, show me the spreadsheet. She looked at the spreadsheet and said, okay, you barely started on the spreadsheet. What else is going on here? Looked and saw what he was looking at. In that moment, he initially felt this, God, if you love me, how could you reveal this and expose me to my wife right now? Can I tell you, God will allow you to be exposed in small sins. And you're like, it's kind of a quote, small sin. I don't know if we can categorize sin that way, but it's a small sin. God, why would you cause such problems now with this relatively small sin when I can work this out with you? Can I tell you, God will allow the exposure of things in our lives. Why? Because He can see the ultimate play of our life and will apprehend us today to prevent us from going there tomorrow. God will work in such a way to get a hold of it. Another situation, a pastor, not a pastor locally, but a pastor I'm aware of. He was texting a woman inappropriately. He wasn't texting his wife. He wasn't pursuing a romantic relationship with his wife. He was pursuing another woman that he worked with. He would text her. It verged on texting to sexting. It was inappropriate. It was wrong. And he finally got exposed. Initially, he was like, God, how could you expose me? We should figure this out. Can I tell you, anytime you have that approach to where God exposes you, you're wrong. You're wrong. God chooses to expose us so, and I hope you hear my pastoral shepherd heart this weekend. Otherwise you'll be like, Daniel shouldn't go on vacation. He gets really grumpy when he comes back. Okay, (laughs) you gotta hear my pastoral heart this weekend. God allows certain things in our lives to be exposed that create pain in the short term to prevent us going in the wrong direction in the long term. The pastor was texting, he was caught. He was corrected. He quit the job. He was asked to step out of the ministry role to get health and healing. He then said, oh, I'm so accepting of this. Thank you. And he embraced it. Three weeks later, everything seemed fine. Yet he then continued and resumed texting this woman. However, sin makes you stupid. He got the numbers mixed up. And while not trying to text his wife, he's like, man, if my wife ever finds out about this, she was so on the forefront of his mind while he was texting this woman, he was texting this woman, but was actually texting his wife. And he came and said, God, how could you? It's the mercy of God that apprehends our choices today to prevent us impacting not only our own lives and the lives of others tomorrow. Okay, hear my heart now. If you feel like you are currently in a point of life where God is kind of pulling back the covering and it's being seen and the first thought within you is, God, if you love me, you wouldn't do this. I want you to look at it from a different perspective. It's because that God loves you that He is doing this. It's called the mercy of God. He loves you too much. So how does this play into this text? It plays into this text because God had a plan for Israel. He didn't want Israel to become like every other nation. This census, this count was militant. It was military in nature. David wanted to count to determine the strength of his nation so that as a king, he could fight the other nations and in some ways become like them. God didn't want that. God could see not just this generation, but the generations to come. And he said, David, it's already in your heart. So I'm gonna permit you to do it now so we can address it now to prevent greater consequences later. Okay, now let's apply this to our lives. We're called to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. So in the immediate, God will sometimes allow the exposure of sin in our lives to apprehend us from destroying our lives ultimately. Embrace it. It's hard. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa. that is not natural. It's not. It's supernatural. It's the supernatural work of God that you embrace it. All of us in this room can think of times where we have been somewhat exposed, but I pray you see the mercy. There's a time that I'm thinking of in my life now where it was the love of God. Now, let me tell you the story of the pastor. His marriage has now since been ultimately restored. I don't wanna guess what could have happened to his life, but let me tell you, I do believe that if God wouldn't have caused the initial exposure, he would not be married to this day. Embrace it. Embrace those times. Well, here's what practically is going on. Verse two, David says to Joab, the commander of the army who is with him, go through the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Go number the people that I may know the number of the people. Joab said to the king, may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times. In other words, what does it even matter the number? God is gonna go before us anyway and multiply us. 
while the eyes of my Lord, the King, still see it. But why does my Lord, the King, delight in this thing? Let me answer that question. I think there are three reasons why David delighted in the count. Number one, pride. Pride. David, as the leader, wanted a count to say, look what I've done. Look at this work. Look what I've done. Do you have any idea what it was when I received it? And let me show you what it is now. Pride. All of us are affected by pride. Partly, in some ways, our culture almost indirectly invites pride. Because if you're unwilling to speak of what you've done, no one else will. Trust God. Trust God to go before you and to present before you what He wants others to see of you. Don't be pride-filled. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So in other words, God will do two things. He will push towards you opposition or He will push towards you favour. And it will all be predicated upon your place in life. Who's proud. Number two, provision. David was beginning to wonder if he almost needed God. Don't ever get to that point to where you're like, man, I'm pretty good at providing. I'm gonna work hard. I've got a good bank account. I've got a good job. I've got a good wife. I've got good moral living. None of those things give you right standing with God and should be a foundation towards hope in your life. Don't put your hope in your home. Don't put your home in your bank account. Don't put your home in your wife or your husband. Don't put your hope there. Find enjoyment there, absolutely. But don't reside your hope there. David was starting to go, man, I kind of got this figured out. I kind of got this. Go number those people. Go number those people. Wow, we're really doing the good thing. Point three, the reason I believe probably that David wanted the census done was power. At some point along the line, probably when his son sought to wrestle power from him, when David reassumed power, he's like, man, I want everyone to know I'm in charge. I want everyone to know. I want to know who I'm in charge of and I want them to know I'm in charge of them. With all this being said, for these three reasons, nonetheless, the census went ahead. Verse four, the the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed from Jordan and began from Arur and from the city that is in the middle of the valley towards Gad and on to Jazar. Verse six, then they came to Gilead. And to a whole lot more places. Verse eight. So when they came and had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. Okay, so for almost 10 months, Joab had been dragging his sorry rear end throughout all of ancient Mideast, counting people. One, two, three. I'm not a numbers person. I've been losing count partway through the village. I'm like, start again. Okay, he's numbering. And all that time he's thinking, at least the king will be happy. At least the king is gonna be happy when I've done this mission that he wants me to do. All while this is going on, God is working on David. God is working on David. David is having sleepless nights. David feels like God is opposing him. All this, and yet he did it and God incited David to do it. God saw what was in David's heart and all of a sudden David said, I don't like what I see in my heart. I don't like what I see in my heart. And it says there in the next verse, David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. It shouldn't surprise us that David blew it. David's just like you and I. He's just a man, just a dude. In some ways, a real like dude in terms of the things he did. Just a guy, not our saviour, not our king, a guy. And Scripture doesn't shy away from revealing the weakness and the underbelly of David's life and sin. So much so, I'm often asking the question of myself, like, how is it that David was a man after God's own heart? The dude should have been medicated. The dude had problems. Like the dude had real issues. Not this bad if you're medicated, but he should have been in that category. He had real problems. How is it that David has a man after God's own heart where it seems like he does whatever he wants to do? I think sometimes we can buy into the notion that a man after or a woman after God's own heart is perfect. And that's wrong. There is no perfection for all fall short of the glory of God. None of us live up to that standard that we would want for our lives. A man after God's own heart is not one that espouses perfection, but one that embraces their imperfection and says, I need the Lord in my life. David publicly, in print and in prayer, acknowledged that he was a fallen man. So much so, look what it says. 
David's heart struck him. He had numbered the people. And because of this, he said to the Lord, verse 10, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. David said, O Lord, please take away from me my iniquity, for I have done very foolishly. Okay, let me speak about this for a moment. There are three reasons why he did the census. But beyond those three reasons, there is a big reason. God said, don't do it. Now, let me give you a big takeaway for the day. If God says, don't do it, don't do it. Okay, it's, it's brilliant. It took me hours of prayer and insight and revelation to get that. I just, here's the point. If God says, don't do it, don't do it. In other words, there are reasons and there are grace-filled reasons behind every no of God. No is an answer. No is not a rejection. No is an answer. Because in the greater narrative of God's story, in the grand story of God, a no is a redirection. A no is not a rejection. A no is, no, 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 don't do that. Here's why. Because I've got a greater story at play here. When God says, don't do it, don't do it. But here's the problem. In our very educated Western mindset in our world, we go, well, God, we're not so sure you're up here. In fact, we kind of think we're kind of up here right now. And if we're not careful, we no longer, don't miss this, we no longer see God as our authority. We see God as our advisor. If God becomes your advisor, you will listen to everything He says and you will put it through a criterion of what you think makes sense. Well, that doesn't make sense. That kind of makes sense. That is logical. I don't agree with that, so we'll discard that part. He becomes your advisor. The moment God is your advisor is the moment that distance will come into your life. We've got to see God as our authority. But in our world, and our culture, we go, that's crazy. Why would I want to be that obedient? If God says, don't do it, I'm like, I don't care. I'm doing it. I'll be forgiven anyway. And we lose sight entirely of what it is that God has spoken into our lives. Men and women, if God has spoken a no into your life, embrace that. But here's what I see, and I'm going to get real pastoral now. And I'm going to speak real vulnerably now as it relates to something that breaks my heart as it relates to obedience. I hear this all the time from people. They go, yeah, yeah, I know what God says about that. I know what God says about that. I know the scripture. I can quote it. I've lived it. I know it. I know that God says don't live a sexually promiscuous life. I know that God says don't do this. I know that God says don't cheat and lie. I know that God says don't gossip. But, but when I do it, I have a peace. I have a spiritual peace. The Lord is okay with that. Can I tell you, and I want you to hear my pastoral heart now, otherwise you'll be like, he is really frustrated. When we say we have a spiritual peace, it is the apex of arrogance in our life because you cannot have a spiritual peace when you're going against a holy God. You cannot say, well, God said it, I'm going against it, but I have a peace. Your peace does not invalidate God's truth. And let me tell you, it's not even peace. I want to talk to you about barbecuing. <laughs> I want you to think about a beautiful piece of steak. How many of you are not vegetarian? Raise your hand. Okay, think of the steak. It's a fantastic piece of steak. It's prime, it's prime cut. You've seasoned it. You go outside, you heat up your grill. It could be charcoal, it can be gas, whatever your preference, a smoker, I don't care. You crank it. it. The temperature gauge is going up, it's smoking, it's burning off. You give it a good clean. You go back inside, you set your Siri watch. You're like, give me a 10 minute countdown, Siri. Don't do that. And then all of a sudden you go back. And you go back and the grill is just ready. It's just wanting, like, give me meat, give me, give me. And you lift up the lid and you take your meat and you lay it on the grill and it is a sound like the sound of an angel. It goes searing the meats. And it's fantastic. You hungry with me? I'm hungry right now. You throw that meat on the grill. It's sizzling, it's sizzling because why? It's searing the meat. You do so for a short while. You take that meat, you turn that meat, you sear that meat. But now pause. You put the meat on the grill. You go get your family. If you're married and you have kids, and you get in the car and you go to Walmart and you go grocery shopping. You leave the grill there. That's fine. Don't worry about it. You go to Walmart. You do your thing. You come out of Walmart. You're like, man, I'm going to get a cup of coffee. You go a cup of coffee. On the way back, you're like, the kids want to go to the park. You're like, okay, but don't be long because ice cream's in the back of the car. Quickly throw the ball. Okay. Let's go home. No, let's not go home. Let's go do something else. Let's just eat the ice cream right now. So you eat the ice cream. You don't go home. Four or five hours later, you're like, oh, the grill. You go back and your steak has become a hockey puck. 
a hockey puck that even the ass couldn't score with currently, but it's a hockey puck. <laughs> and you take that hockey puck and now, all right, switch with me. That hockey puck is your life and you go to God and go, but God, I have a peace about it. What am I saying? You have seared your conscience. Men and women, don't ever mistake a spiritual peace for a seared conscience. Because if you're disobeying God, you don't have a spiritual peace, you have a seared conscience. You have seared your conscience so much, it no longer goes on the grill, it's just dead. Ask the Holy Spirit to soften your conscience. Ask the Holy Spirit to soften your heart. Because the only way we can respond when we've offended God is not to go, God, I'm really okay with this actually, but to say, God, I'm broken. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because a broken and a contrite heart, God has yet to deny. Whereas a seared conscience, the Lord says, okay, let's just pour more of the Holy Spirit on that heart. Now, don't feel judgment if you feel like you have a seared conscience, but feel the invitation to say, Holy Spirit, soften my heart. But please don't say when you're in sin, I have a peace. God's okay with this because he's not. You're speaking out of a seared, dying soul, not out of one that is sensitive to the works of the Spirit. David responds, he's broken. He's absolutely broken. He says, take away my iniquity. David arose, verse 11, in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet David. David see us saying, go and say to David, thus says the Lord, three things I offer to you. Choose one of them that I may do it. So Gad said to David, who told him and said to him, three months here of famine or three months before your foes, or three days pestilence in the land, basically, which one do you want? And then look at verse 14. David said to Gad, none of them. I'm in great distress. Rather, instead of falling into the hand of man, he says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord. Okay, there's a real principle here. When you know that you are loved by God, when you truly know that you are loved by God, even discipline is mercy. You know, that, that does not make sense. If you know the love of the Father and you're accepted, you don't receive His correction as rejection. You receive correction as mercy. Why? Because God can see the end of your life and He says, stop now, stop now, stop now. He is stopping you from something that four years from now, 12 years from now, will result in the end of your marriage. Will result in your kids saying, Dad, screw you. It will result in your life being broken. And you go, whoa, 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 I'm so offended that God would expose me right now. You should be offended based upon the choices that you're making that will result in the destruction of your life. And my life too. My life too. It's not just your life. This isn't about we go to church so you can be convicted. We go to church so that we're all convicted. Men and women, David was broken. He had a heart after God because he was broken when he was, realized he did wrong. So much so, he says, I want to fall into the hand of God. It is the best place to be. Sure enough, verse 15, the discipline came. The Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men. 70,000 men. Okay, remember the context of what we're looking at. It was a census. David found strength in numbers. What is the very thing that God removes? Numbers. God will remove the very thing in your life that moves from good to God. If you take something good that is a gift and you make it a God that you worship, God in grace, if you love him, will remove it. Why? Because in mercy, and this is the reason, if you're here today and you're like, man, I don't know the Lord, I'm not sure I get this faith thing, you're like, I do not understand this. Keep pressing in, keep asking good questions about the Lord, keep asking good questions about the Scripture. Keep showing up, keep being here and around this environment because you will be washed over by the love of God. It's the goodness of God that wins you to the point of repentance. So much so, David says, I don't want the man of God to dole, I don't want the man to dole out judgment, I want God to dole out mercy and justice. And that's what happens. Well, from this point onwards, it is a powerful redirect towards the end of the narrative. Verse 16, the angel of the Lord did indeed stretch out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, but the Lord relented, that's mercy, from the calamity and said to the angel who is working destruction, it's enough, it's enough, stay your hand. 
The angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Okay, Aruna the Jebusite had a piece of land. It was a threshing floor. A threshing floor, we don't understand what this is, but the farm boy in me does. A threshing floor is a point on a mound. It's a high point of dirt. It's a high point of dirt because the wind comes and whips up the hill and blows as you drop the weight of the grain, the chaff blows as the wind comes up the hill. It's a mound. It's a mount. It's a high point in the countryside. Sure enough, he owns a threshing floor. David goes and says, I need to buy your threshing floor. And Aruna says, no, no, no. I want you to have it. <clears throat> I want this plague and this pestilence to stop 70,000 men and counting. Yeah, 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 God's relented, but we need to do something. Have my land. And David says, no, 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 I can't do that. I need to pay for this. I need to pay for this. I will not give something to God that costs me, <coughs> excuse me, nothing, nothing. So he came to him, he says, okay, raise up an altar. Verse 22, Aruna said to David, let my Lord, the king, just take it and offer what seems good to him. Verse 24, but the king said to Aruna, no, I gotta buy it. I will not offer burnt offerings to my Lord, the God that cost me nothing. So David, bought the threshing floor and pay attention to this threshing floor because we're gonna stay here for the rest of the message. And the oxen for 50 shekels, excuse me, and David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the final verse, the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Okay, <clears throat> I don't wanna make an overreach here. But the reason I wanna make a big deal about this piece of land, this piece of dirt is because in Scripture, we have seen this piece of dirt before. This piece of dirt, the threshing floor, 1,000 years earlier, was the same piece of dirt where Abraham stood with Isaac and was about to sacrifice him to the Lord when God provided a ram. God provided a means to appease God 1,000 years earlier. Same pile of dirt 1,000 years later, the plague of God is averted because of a sacrifice on that piece of dirt. But it gets better than that. That same piece of dirt, some years later, David's son Solomon, because his dad had purchased it, builds the temple on that mound. That mound is Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah to this day in Jerusalem is the temple mound. Just a stone's throw from this piece of dirt throughout all of history. Sacrifice insufficient, Abraham. Sacrifice insufficient, David, the plague. Sacrifice Solomon, 1,000 plus sacrifices insufficient. Old covenant, Mount Moriah. Just a stone's throw away from Mount Moriah, there is another mount and it's called Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary is where blood spilled, one and done. Atonement. At one moment, atonement, at one moment, Jesus and the sacrifice and the spilling of blood appeased, diverted the plague and purchased our freedom. If there are ever people that say you don't need the Old Testament, let me tell you the Old Testament is the concealing of God. The New Testament is the revealing of God. But throughout all of the Testament and the covenant of God is this piece of dirt, this piece of dirt, and yet it was insufficient until the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. We don't need to live on Mount Moriah, people. Our king does not save us on Mount Moriah. David sins. Moses, because he broke the law, could not inherit the promise. The Old Testament leaves us longing for a king that can save us. But in the New Testament, we go from Mount Moriah to Mount Calvary. And Jesus, one and done for you and me, that we won't live subject to the yoke of that slavery, but that we will be clothed with righteousness. That no matter the exposing of our lives, no matter the pain of our lives, no matter those points when we go, I blew it, I blew it. We can rest on the hill that is Mount Calvary, that Jesus Christ purchased our freedom. If you're a Jesus follower this weekend, I'm gonna invite the ushers forward at this point for us to begin passing out the elements of communion. If you've turned your life over to Jesus Christ, you love Him as your Saviour and Lord, I want you to take of the elements and hold them. Hold these elements on this weekend where we say we're searching for a King, we're searching for Jesus. As you look at the Old Testament, every sacrifice was insufficient. Some of you here today are living a religious life 
and it's insufficient. Now track with me, pay attention now. Some of you are trying to do everything you can to live the moral right life, the right life. You're trying to live morally right. And you're like, there'll be another Mount Moriah, there'll be another Mount Moriah. And you're trying to live this moral life. You would almost say it's religious. That king is insufficient. Mount Moriah is insufficient. We need to move the covenant to Mount Calvary and thank Jesus for the all-sufficiency of Jesus. Don't live trying harder. Don't live by saying, I'm just gonna gut it out. I'm gonna check the box. Mount Moriah is a to-do list. Mount Calvary is a tis done list. It's finished. The blood has been spilled once and for all. That when we respond and we receive Jesus Christ into our lives, we are saved. We have received forgiveness. The clicks, the looks, the glances, the texts. They wound us, but they don't condemn us. Romans 8.1 now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love this quote, Pastor John Piper, the wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that was slain. I want us to take just a few moments of quiet And I want you quietly, if you're able, to thank the Lord for what He's done in your life to sometimes uncover you. I am personally thankful for a time in my life where God allowed the uncovering of my life to be for the beauty of His life in me. And it's because of that time. Embrace it. Receive it. Thank God for it. Let's just let the music play over you. If you're still waiting for the elements, you can still pray. They'll tap you when they get there. Lord Jesus, thank you that you receive us. And thank you that Jesus in your flesh, you took upon your flesh, the body, the condemnation that was rightfully ours, but came righteously yours that we are not rightfully condemned, we are gracefully redeemed. Your mercy. Thank you for revealing your mercy to me every day. Thank you, God, for your patience, your mercy in our lives. I'm gonna read one last scripture and then we're gonna take the elements and then I'll pray and close. It's Revelation 7, 9 through 10. After this, I looked and there before me, think of this verse in the context of the census count today in the text. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before Jesus. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to God who the King, the King of all kingdoms, sits on the throne. Let's hold up the bread. Jesus, thank You for this bread that represents the broken body of Christ, that we can join with the body of Christ around the world at this moment in professing Your return and professing to be faithful in telling others of You in this day. Let's take the bread. And Jesus, thank You for the juice, that this juice represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ, so that as far as the East is from the West, so have these transgressions been removed from us. Let's take the juice together. Father, thank You so much. So much, God, for all that You're doing. Would You stand with me? We're gonna close by just the team playing over You. And I wanna just close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, this weekend, may we by standing, declaring a new conviction to stand. May we declare a new conviction to stand for that which is right. We honour You, Jesus. We bless You. We affirm You. We celebrate You. In Your Name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you are